Hey girls, Bethany here with a wicked awesome deal for all of our listeners. If you know me in real life, you're probably aware I don't really cook. In fact, my most famous dish in this household is likely my ramen noodles. But this year, I'm committed to changing the narrative. So, Prep Dish to the rescue. If you've never heard of Prep Dish, here's the deal. They're actually a healthy subscription-based meal planning service. So every single week when you sign up, they send you an email that has your grocery list and all of the instructions for prepping the most incredible meals for your family. I'm talking meals that are smoky paprika chicken legs with a trio of roasted vegetable or turkey and zucchini lasagna. I don't know about you, but that beats ramen noodles or chili mac any day of the week. I'm excited to enter this new adventure, and I want to invite you to join me. So here's what you do. Go to prepdish.com slash heygirl and get a free two-week trial for free. That's incredible. I hope you'll join me and let me know how it goes. Take photos of your meals, and I'll take photos of mine, and together, Let's go from being the ramen noodle queen to, oh, I don't know, smoky paprika princess. Once again, go to prepdish.com slash heygirl for your two-week free trial. Hey, girls, and welcome to another episode of the Hey Girl podcast. We're your hosts, Bethany Needham and Laurie Casagrande. And each week, we get to share with you stories from women of all ages and stages of life who are following Jesus right where they're at. Our prayer is that each story encourages you to run your race in your place. In today's episode, we're interviewing Lori Brown Harris for the second time. Lori was a guest in season one, episode 17. It was called The Beautiful Messiness of Urban Missions and Bipolar with Lori Brown Harris. Okay, hopefully you've checked out season one, episode 17. So now it's time to get started in season two and hear the second chapter of this story. So Bethany, if you can give listeners one word to describe this interview, what would you say? The word would be courage because every single time that I talk to Lori in the Instagram posts that she has, I just think that this woman is incredibly courageous and not in the way that maybe I thought of courage as a child, but in the way that she is willing to continue to walk in life in the hardest of days and just be totally vulnerable and open about it. If you don't follow her on Instagram, you absolutely need to pause this episode and do it now because the messages that she shares from her stories, from good days and bad days, they are going to help you understand more of who God is. I love Lori. I appreciate so much her honesty as she shares openly about the journey that her and her family have been on. And she might be one of the most courageous women that I know. So without further ado, let's introduce you to our friend, Lori Lori Brown Harris. Ready? You are my first official return guest. Yay! <laughs> Which means when we said we liked you, we meant it. <laughs> that is good to know. Yes. Definitely good to know. Okay, truthfully, I've loved every guest that we had, but. You in particular, I follow you on Instagram, which is why I just assume we're dear friends. And because of that, I know you've lived a heck of a lot of life in the last eight months. (laughs) I have, yeah. Wow. And so maybe you could give us a little snapshot. Where were we eight months ago? And then, then we'll go forward from there. Okay. Well, eight months ago, uh, my husband had just returned from a 30-day in-treatment program for bipolarism. And we've been married 17 years. We've been in ministry together for 20 years. Uh, We've been serving an impoverished neighborhood uh, as urban missionaries and church planters. And we had no idea he had bipolar until his body simply quit working. So at our last interview, I was still reeling with, what does this mean for our family? And trying to pick up the pieces and figure out how this fits, like what is the purpose of all of this? We knew at that time our life was going to be drastically changing. We just didn't know in what capacity. So I think I had a lot more questions of, Lord, what now? 
you know, and trusting that he was good and that this was for our good and his glory. But I had no idea what he was doing. I learned so much from our first interview. But one thing we talked about, which has helped me a lot, is we talked about how a lot of what hid, I guess, or you didn't necessarily know, oh, my husband's bipolar, is that the idea of being manic, which is where he kind of lived in that high energy, high functioning is a lot people outside the world of mental illness hear that word and they think crazy. They're like, Oh, a manic Mm -hmm. person, you know, I don't know what they picture, crazy hair, running around, tearing clothes, whatever. But in actual reality, manic can present as a incredibly high functioning, high energy because really manic people, they can go without sleep and they just, yeah. Until just like you said, their bodies crash. So There's some crazy like number percentage of surgeons who have bipolar because they have the ability to stand on an operating floor for 14, 16 hours at a time. And that's not humanly possible. So yeah, there are lots of good things. And then if you couple the mental illness with being a Christian and then being a ministry and you have the restraint of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to channel that manic into good things for the kingdom. And that's what he's done forever. And I've been running alongside forever. And my kids have been running alongside forever. We have six kids. And so it's been a marathon. Actually, it's been a sprint that, that felt like a marathon. It was yeah. The stop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what, I mean, that struck me when you talked about being the person that does not have bipolar, that is not running on manic, trying to keep up with someone that is manic. Yeah. And you... When we talked last, like you were coming again, first realizing, oh, so this pace is not sustainable. Like, yes. so I'm not crazy. Like we're going way too fast, way too yes. hard. I'm just going to encourage our listeners, go back and listen to the first episode and kind of fill in the blanks. But I would love as we sit down again, it's been eight months, but so much has happened. Maybe you could just take some time to fill us in from that moment when Thad had just come back, you can correct me from just starting to sink in. You hadn't even really had it. Oh, yeah. To process. So no, while he was gone, I was home alone with the kids. I uh, didn't have a job at the time. It was fine. We could financially float, you know, for a few months. But I was home alone. The church plant was still happening. And I felt a great responsibility to keep showing up because I felt the burden of like it's a small plant. We need, they need help. You know, I I host everything. It was that pressure of needing to show up and do the stuff and keep leading the ministries that I'm leading and process the full stop that had happened. It wasn't like a gradual thing. It was that fall on the floor. He can no longer walk. He was slurring his speech to two weeks later. He's gone. You know, there was no time to, for it to sink in. And I think when he came home, I expected him to come home medicated, but ready to charge right back into the church plant and be a better leader. And the person who came home from the ranch was not that person. Hmm. He was still fuzzy. He was on a lot of medications. Um, we were still figuring those out and figuring out how they affected every aspect of our life. It was tough. I mean, I think I cried more the first couple of months he was home than I probably have our entire marriage because it was he wasn't the same person. Uh, we started going to marriage counseling because I needed help in figuring out how to view like my entire life now through the lens of bipolar and not hold him responsible or feel bitterness or anger towards the life I had to live because he had an undiagnosed mental illness. And I also had to deal with the anger I felt towards his family for knowing that it was a, they had a family history and they had never shared that. And that's an important thing. And I just thought, you know, I'm looking for this in my own kids. It was just a flood of, of just a series of thoughts and emotions that I could never slow down enough to grab hold of. Dad went back to fellowship in June. I think he preached his first sermon in June after he hadn't preached since February. So it had been a long time. All summer long, I mean, my full intent was, you know, next week he'll be back to himself. Next week he'll be back to himself. We can do this. He can work the full-time job. We can keep planting the church. He can still lead. He can still pastor. He can still disciple. We can still do all the stuff. We'll just be slower at it now. You know, that's what I'm thinking because I didn't have a frame of reference for any other kind of life. Yeah, We've done this for so long. I couldn't imagine anything else. 
in the marriage counseling, I think was was when I finally realized that that couldn't do it. He was going to therapy and continues to go to therapy to try to retrain his brain. He's only on one medication now. But it has been a long process of realizing life will no longer be like it used to. And so that means that we have to take control and start saying no to things. Like this was God's permission to say, hello, you can stop the crazy. (laughs) We just didn't feel like we could. We felt uber responsible to keep pastoring the church that we felt led to plant. We felt responsible to every couple that we had spent time with and discipled and were leading. We felt like it was our fault that we've gotten them in this church plant. There's all this work to do, and now we can't do the work. And someone else is going to have to pick up all the pieces of all the stuff that we started. That was a heavy, heavy burden. It wasn't until the end of August that we began to realize that we were going to have to step down from leading fellowship. The other thing that happened over the summer was all of our neighbors moved out. You know, we're urban missionaries. We've been living here for six years. We had ongoing neighborhood ministries happening all the time. And over the course of like four or five months, the entire neighborhood moved out, except for two families. One of those families will be moving next week. So we were watching not only dad's mental illness affecting our family, but realizing that all the things that we were doing, like they, they were just going away. It was a very eye-opening experience for us to realize that God was removing every single thing from our life in order to give us rest. I spent a lot of time joking last summer that I just wanted to get on an RV and just drive around for a year as a family and have no responsibilities and put down no roots because I just wanted time to think. I wanted to shut down every voice that was speaking to us. I wanted to not have to see anybody. I just wanted us to get still and quiet as a family so we could figure out what we were doing. Because it's hard. You're like, you're in a ministry family, you're in a fishbowl, and everyone's speaking in and they're sending encouraging letters in the mail, and they don't realize that every ounce of encouragement or this is what I feel like God wants me to tell you, like all those voices speaking in all the time make it nearly impossible to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And that's what was happening. And so God began to remove some things, and then we prayerfully decided to resign from fellowship. And we sat down with our deacon board and our other elder, and we just told them what was going on in our life. And, and we said, you know, you don't ha- we don't want you to feel the burden of continuing with this plant. We feel like it's a healthy enough church. It's growing. We feel like you guys can lead it. But ultimately, that's your decision. And I, I remember I sobbed like the two-hour meeting because I just thought, Lord, like if this church ceases to exist, I will feel like, All of this time here was for nothing. Like Mm. it just was for nothing. As of right now, the church is growing. It's, I would say it's flourishing without us there, which is also very sad. (laughs) I mean, on a human level, you want to feel like I had an impact, you know, and we did, but it's over. And for some reason, we're not a part of the flourishing. And Mm. so here we are. I'm homeschooling the four youngest kids again, because in our process of getting life super, super small. I felt like I needed to give up serving at my middle school. Well, our schools are not the kind of schools that you want to send your kids to if you're not going to be actively involved. So I'm homeschooling the four youngest kids again, and the older kids are in high school, and life has like come to a screeching halt. That's like years within eight yeah. months. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I love that you said kind of in your human nature, that response to the church is flourishing. How many times in life do we find that like we want things to continue? You know, we do ministry to see God work. So there's a side like, God, I don't want this to fail because then I'll feel like I wasted my time. But I don't want it to do so well that it seemed like it didn't need me. So yes, or just even that we got cheated out of that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, they we worked so dang hard for six years. We had one failed church. Then we started over like idiots. And here we are flourishing. And God's like, I'm sorry, that's not for you to do. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? That is not fair. It's the Moses experience, right? It's, hey, I want you to do all this work to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And you know what? Hang out in the in the wilderness for 40 years. But 
Oh, going in the promised land. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. That's You're going to die. You. Sorry. Sorry. You got to stay in the wilderness. <laughs> like they're yeah. going to go on without you. Nobody wants. Yeah. Everybody looks up to Moses and we all preach the bit, but nobody wants Moses's ministry. Like, no, 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 I think he was a sad man. I can only imagine he was like, Lord, I can, I can only imagine how I would feel all the time. I'd be angry. I'd be frustrated. I would scream at God all the time. <laughs> you know, I would sit and be sitting in the wilderness like easily. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And on, if we're all honest with ourselves, there's there's a piece of that in everything, right? Like the desire. Yeah. We want God's glory, but we'd like our appreciation. Like, I want to be appreciated yeah. in the midst of, you know, God's yeah. glory for sure. You mentioned yeah. something that has actually been a theme recently for me and I hearing other people talk about it, which is being in that place where there's too many voices to hear the Holy Spirit. I love yep. that line. I just had a conversation with someone about this where they actually were on the other side where God had called them to a season of loneliness. But in that season, they look back and realize that when they were surrounded by godly influences and good mm-hmm. Christian friends and community that they almost didn't realize they didn't need God. They didn't need God because they had all these, uh, and not as in they didn't actually meet God, but they kind of lived like that. Like, well, I have a great pastor and a great small group and all these great friends. So when things came up for them, they had a thousand places to go and they had all these voices speaking in. Can you take a minute and just talk to me about how do you choose that? And what does that look like? Like, how do you shut down Without completely sticking your head in the sand, obviously, Mm -hmm. we don't want to discredit that having great friends and community is awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. Yeah, but what does it look like? But sometimes being a part of a great community and being surrounded by great friends helps helps hide the very thing that needs to come out. And I say that in the the best kind of way. When we were at Fellowship Dallas, that was, you know, he was working two jobs, going to seminary full time. We were having babies left and right. And I think our close knit community of believers helped love us and steer us so well during that season that it helped like Thad's body. It would have been like prime time for his body to just shut down and his bipolarism come to the surface, but it kind of masked. They helped cover what was really going on unbeknowing to them and to us. Um, but here in this lonely season of life where life was really, really tough, it really has just been us and the Lord. Um, and it was allowed to come to the surface. And I think for, for us in this season right now, it is, I think it is like, I've read, have you ever read the book by, by Dorothy Day? It's called the long loneliness. And she just talks about how there's so much loneliness in following Christ because we're to make our home in him. There has to be an element where it's just you and the Lord. We're made to be in community, but there are just some things that your community can't help you process or can't help you walk through. And this has been one of those seasons. And I think for us, one of the, you know, we talked earlier about how you're just tired. You know, ministry comes to a screeching halt and you realize I'm exhausted. And that and I both started having all these telltale signs of exhaustion that we had never paid attention to. For me, one of my biggest things was I realized I'm a super friendly, outgoing person, but I realized in the last couple of years, whenever I'm out in public, I hold my head down. I don't want to make eye contact. When I get a text message or an Instagram message, I seize up on the inside because I don't want to open it. I don't know what it's going to say. Is it going to hurt my feelings? Is this person going to need something from me? Are they not going to like something I have written? It was it was the realization that I was feeling so wounded. I think by 20 years of ministry and not caring for my, my physical body, when I had time to stop, I realized that I was more unhealthy than I ever could have imagined. And so for my own well-being, I could not put myself in a position to be in a conversation or have a coffee date or have dinner with someone. If I thought even for a smidgen that the conversation was going to go someplace that I was going to feel misunderstood or I was going to be challenged or that mental illness was, was going to be prayed away. In a sense, you know what I mean? So I realized that in order for me to get healthy, I had to make my circle of influence 
people who were influencing me so small because I was unable to engage a thoughtful conversation with someone who would say something that they didn't realize was going to crush me to the core. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I would immediately absolutely. take great offense. Like how the heck did you say that? I wouldn't say that to them, but I would get in the car and cry all the way home. So it's been, it's probably been six weeks of that, maybe eight weeks of just saying, you know what? I'm going to have to say no to everybody right now until I can get healthy. And that's for my good. That's for the good of the body of Christ right now, because I'm no good in the body of Christ in that regard. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Man, I'm listening to you and thinking, you mentioned it earlier, but this idea of of quietness, being able to hear the Holy Spirit, but everything you're describing, being able to see those red flags, or I always call them the dash lights in our lives, the things where you know, okay, you might be running a little low on fuel here. I'll use my car as an example. This is a, this is a woman's podcast. Somebody out there has to like cars. <laughs> I I need to preface this. I know nothing about cars. I'm not smart. I'm the one that's like, what color is it? That's what I base my yeah. <laughs> decisions on. Yeah. But I do know that when I am in a hurry or I'm rushed around, I ignore those lights because I don't have time. Like this yep. happened in this freezing cold weather. I know you're down south. This might be an education for you, but in <laughs> in the cold, because air, you know, shrinks down, your tire gauges are all out of whack. Gotcha. So if it's been cold and I cl- like really cold, which around here we've been in the negatives forever, oh, wow. it feels like if I climb in my car, it's likely that the lights are going to come on. Hey, this tire pressure is low. This tire pressure is low. Yeah. And. I have been working recently early in the morning and it's just been, I don't have time to deal or figure out what is going on here. So I just have to ignore it. And I feel like in life, that's how, that's how it is when you're going so fast and so hard, you don't have time for dash lights. And so as you're sitting here describing this to me, I'm like, how important is it us to create quiet spaces. Yes, to know God. Absolutely. First and foremost. But I'm writing notes as you're talking. You're like, you're like a well of, of wisdom, just so you know. I feel like I I, I was telling that last night, I'm like vomiting all this stuff. We're doing this keto diet because it's supposed to help with bipolar. It like makes your brain like fire. Or for the last couple of weeks, I feel like I can't stop. Like I can't stop talking. I'm like able to put sentences together again. And I'm like, I was like, he's at the end of the table. Like what is going on? You've not had anything to say forever. <laughs> and now you've got all the thoughts. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. And I'm thinking like in those quiet spaces, how important it is to know yourself. Because if you don't know how your car's supposed to run, you don't know if something's off. And yeah. I love how you were saying, I'm an outgoing person. And all of a sudden I enter a crowd of people and my head is down. That seizing up when a text message comes in, I'm listening to you thinking, I'm realizing how many of those signs I have not paid attention to in myself mm-hmm. because you and yeah. I have the outgoing thing in common. I have found myself talking to people and excusing it as I used to be an outgoing person, but yeah. now... And literally, I'm having this aha moment as I'm talking to you, and we've talked off mic that this is a season for me of kind of slowing down and life coming to a screeching halt. And as I'm like going to get choked up talking about it, as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Except that for me, rather than recognizing it as a, this actually is a a sign of unhealthiness, I've just kind of like, well you know, I'm different than I used to be. Like I used to love being around lots of people. And now, you know, people invite me. I've gotten to the place where, and now I'm going to scare people away from ever wanting to invite me anywhere. But if (laughs) if it's like a social event or, Hey, let's get together and talk rather than the normal, like, yay, like human interaction. I feel that seize up of, it's almost feels stressful. Like, do I have the time or energy to do this? Like, am I over committing or am I going to crash? Yeah. And for me, it's always the fear that this person is inviting me out to this thing because they inadvertently need something from me. So the whole time we're, we're, cause we've honestly, we've planted a church among prodigals and we live in an impoverished neighborhood. So 
most people who want to hang out with me are, it's because their marriage is in crisis, they're, you know, an addict or whatever. So I've been, I've conditioned my brain to assume that people need something from me all the time. And they don't, because on, I was reading recently and I think it was, I don't remember who it was by, maybe it was Barbara Brown Taylor when she talked about how, you know, in ministry, you're often included in, in, in everyone's sorrow. You know, when, in the, when anybody has a tragedy or a heartbreak or a sorrow, they are going to seek out person of the cloth <laughs> uh, for encouragement, for truth, for comfort. But you're often not included in the joys in the mm. lives of people. So, and I think for six years, we've been on the receiving end of everyone's tragedy and not invited into the joyous moments. And so for a, you can do that for a, for a little while, but then you realize that all your human interactions with people are sorrowful occasions or they're super heavy and you don't ever seem to get above water to experience the joy with people. Okay. You just blew my mind <laughs> because that's so true. And I would say people in ministry also helpers, people who mm -hmm. are that friend, because I think it probably that's a given if you do ministry where you're serving yeah. people, that's probably a given in your life. You end up in a lot of those situations, hospitals, in counseling sessions, whatever it is. But I also, that resonated with my friends who are people that are just giving and generous and the person that is on everybody's favorites list to call if, because they're good listeners and they're great in moments of crisis, which is awesome. That's not a terrible thing, yeah. but how often do they end up, that's their main, main human interaction is walking yes. through hard things. And that does wear on you. I it would does. say- and I don't know, I'd be interested as to whether you, you experience this or not. For me in this season, it's not even just that necessarily people need things from me, but the people that I know are reaching out because they care about me and they want, they want to do for me, that overwhelms me. Not in like a, yeah. oh, that's so, but actually I, it makes no logical sense why someone caring for me and wanting to serve me would take from me. Yep. But I feel like I'm at that point where even that takes from me where I'm like, that yes, means absolutely. I have to articulate my needs to you. And that's exhausting right now because I can't, exhausting. Even, I can't, I can't even, I can't tell you what my needs are. I don't even know, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, I don't know how to tell you my needs because I can't even tell myself, like I'm trying to figure that out right now. Gosh, it's amazing that we don't just live in a cave and yeah. behind a rock. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've considered it. <laughs> you considered it, yes. Or yeah. an RV traveling around the country. An RV. That sounds very for sure. So I'm gonna be honest, you're a few months down the line from where I feel like I'm sitting and our stories are very different, but still that kind of me too experience of yes. I'm coming from a million miles an hour to a screeching halt. What are some of the things that God has spoken to you or you are kind of learning and walking through to kind of come from that place? Cause that sounds all, you know, we're all down on yeah. people exhaust me and I, you know, which, yeah. but how do we move forward from there? Because we don't want to live in this. Yes. Now we see the dash lights, but what do we do about them? Yeah. I think the first thing is to see the dash lights. Like you have to slow down long enough to see them and say, Hey, I should probably get that checked out. And I think in order to do that, you have to unapologetically walk out of life for a while. Hmm. We're down to the essentials that it works one job. It pays the bills. That's all we do. We don't do anything else because we can't do anything else. If I do something now, I'm going to offer somebody the worst part of me, which they don't need that. You know, I want, to love people. I, and I want to love them well, and I want to engage and I want to be helpful again. And I want to be encouraging and I want to be that listening ear. And I want to, to help people grow in the Lord. And I, I would love to lead women again, but not today. So for me, it is being intentional about being really quiet and really still and doing nothing, not reading a book, not listening to a podcast. I do listen to a lot of music, but I'm gradually trying to cut out the music because I need the silence. I think I've trained my brain to function in a particular way and I need to untrain my brain that way. I need to be able to have the mind of Christ and see my belovedness 
in light of how others may treat me or how I perceive that they treat me, I need to be totally grounded in who I am in Christ. And I think we can all say, oh, we know, we know, we know. But you forget when you get really busy and you have so many other people influencing your life, you forget, no, this is not who I am. I'm not who they say I am. That's a big thing. And I think the other thing is that are really just learning so much about the brain and the body and how, you know, God uses, he illuminates truth to anybody, you know? And so your help may not come from a Christian. Um, We are big advocates of mental health, um, going to counseling, seeing a therapist, taking care of your whole entire body and doing what you have to do to heal. And don't say you're sorry about it. Like it's necessary. And the more that the healthier we get, and the more we talk about getting healthy, the more it gives other people permission to say, hey, I'm really not healthy, particularly people in ministry. I've noticed that every time I share something on Instagram now, it's kind of my safe place to share. But I mean, I'm like inundated with people. Most of them are in ministry who are at rock bottom and they don't feel like they can or that they should or that uh, is therapy good for them. And I'm, I'm like reading the list of things and I'm like, yes, you need therapy. You need someone else speaking into your life who doesn't need you, you know? Wow. Um, yes. I think, yes, I think that that was my thing. I had a lot of people in my life and I could share with them, but I needed someone who didn't need me. Um, someone that I could dump the load on and, and just smoke away. I needed someone on the outside to, to make sense of all of my puzzle pieces and help me put them back together. Because when you're in a crisis or you're so unhealthy, emotionally, spiritually, all those things, all that's in your brain is just a fog of things that are going on, thoughts. You can't put it together. And so you walk around feeling possibly defeated, exhausted. Like, what is the point of life? And I've had some space now in this quiet for God to be able to order the things in my life and illuminate some truth to me. Like that, the timing of his illness opened the door for, he got a permission at work recently, which is awesome. And it was just the right timing. It was like God was ordering all of it. And you know, we wanted a Sabbath. I mean, we wanted a sabbatical, but we couldn't afford to take a sabbatical. We're by vocational ministers. But God's given us a sabbatical. That's still working his full-time job. But the, the part of our life that was crushing us um, and giving us no family time at all, he's re- like he's removed all of those things. We've had all this all these snow days. Like we've had long, lazy weeks of nothingness. Mm-hmm. And yesterday I went walking uh, before the snow hit, and I realized halfway through my walk that I felt happy. Like it was like a I felt happy, and I haven't felt happy in a year, probably maybe two. Wow, like, genuinely. Like, for real happy. So I think God is doing what God does. But we have to make space. Like, we have to observe the Sabbath. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to be intentional about doing the things that that help us get well. So many people say, you don't have time for that. Well, you have to cut stuff out. Like, you... You just have to do it. It's just the bottom line. Or you're going to end up, end up like that. I mean, that's our joke. But, you know, you'll, your body can't do it. It will eventually shut down. My um, pastor says a lot in regards to the excuse, I don't have time for that, is you make time for what you want to do. And mm-hmm. that's just the reality of all of us. You know, if you look at your life and you look at the things that fill your time, you you have filled your time with your priorities. So it's really... If yeah. you want to make time, then you you have to reprioritize. And that involves sacrifice. But yeah. that's where things go higher up in priorities. And therefore, it allows things to fall off the list of, you know what? I love that thing. I don't want to give it up. But right now, it's not the time. Yeah, I had this image the whole time you were speaking. Maybe it's from God and maybe it's just my exhaustion. So... The producer can filter right. it if this is sacrilege. <laughs> <laughs> but in our house, we used to have a statement a lot when things would go terribly wrong yeah, and seem a little hopeless, which is, you know what? God's still on the throne. And it was such a simple way of, for me, bringing perspective on, you know what? I am flat on my face. You know, my knees are scraped. My face hurts, but God is still on the throne. And the image he gave me as you were talking is 
your decision to let life come to a screeching halt, to prioritize or be intentional about this time with God is almost like letting God be the one that's on the throne. Because in ministry, I think we fight, we fight for space there. Like we want to be about God, but up on his throne with him. And I just think about the message that you're sharing with people is you are you are freeing space on that throne. I just literally am picturing ministry leaders all hopping off the throne. Like, Oh wait, (laughs) I don't need to be up here. Like this is not my job. And I am killing myself trying to do God's job when God is like, um, listen, I'm inviting you into this to be with me, but I'm not, I'm not inviting you because I need you to do my part. (laughs) Like I'm God. He doesn't need us at all. That's the thing. And I think when we intentionally observe the Sabbath and we intentionally rest, we're saying, we're communicating to God. Hey, I trust that you've got this and you don't need me. And he's like, hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Get out of my way. (laughs) I know. And that's where I feel a little sacrilege thing, but I almost picture God on his throne being like, okay, finally, like, are you ready to kind of reset? And that I just see the ministry that you have. And I know for you, this is raw. It's real. You're not writing on Instagram sermons that you're not walking in muck. (laughs) People say all the time, like, thanks for that. And my thought is that every word of that was hard won. Like I had, I learned that kicking and screaming and I didn't like it at all. Yeah. And I think for I think for me and, and for Thad, the realization that, that God was asking us to give up good kingdom things. He wasn't asking us to give up fun stuff. It was it was like the work. Like he was asking us to give up the work of our life. Yeah. And rest. And that doesn't go over well with people. Honestly, you know, that I've, I have felt a lot of shame about choosing to rest. Honestly, in the Christian community we talk about observing the Sabbath. We talk about rest, but when it comes right down to it, we don't give each other permission to do so. You know, we don't give each other permission to tap out for a season. And it's so necessary. Like it's so necessary. It's so true. There's kind of this unspoken, maybe sometimes it is spoken when somebody taps out and I've felt this, whether or not it's just my own sensitivity or people outright feeling this is, wow, it must be nice to be able to tap out. Yes. Like it must be nice to not have to work full time, but that's not everyone's reality. And so, Hey, can you not like, I've almost felt fear to talk about it. I don't know if it's that I don't want people's response or I'm really, it's almost that feeling of, I'm not trying to pour salt on any wounds here, but to be straight up honest, God's provided financially for us for a season that I can slow down. Yeah. But like you just said, I don't feel the permission to slow down. I still feel that there are some people who have been incredible. Like, I am so glad that you, that God's done this. Like, I just Mm -hmm. feel like it's his grace over you. Yeah. But I would have to say the majority has been, okay, so what are you going to do though? Like what's next? And I'm like, what if what's next is just a nap? (laughs) Like what if that's the next thing? Yeah. And we've had, we get this question often and it's not, not in a direct way, but kind of roundabout, right? Like, so you've quit the ministry. (laughs) I'm like, well, yeah, to Day we did like, <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not in ministry now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But my ministry right now is to care for my family and care for my body. And if, if my ministry includes me going to counseling so that I can share like what I learned there for people who can't afford to go, that's a ministry. It's not working for the church per mm. se, you know, but I am, I'm still serving the Lord and honoring him and glorifying him with my life but my life just doesn't look as busy as it used to. And that's, that's a hard lesson for me to learn because I'm a doer and I'm a people pleaser. And I, I've, I have wanted to hide our season of rest because I felt guilty because we've, we've lived in a marginalized community where the need is so great. And I have felt, you know, when you're blogging, you, sometimes you don't realize you're building a platform, you know, with a certain message. And I haven't blogged since last July 
because my message no longer fit the platform I had inadvertently built. Hmm. It just didn't fit. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm getting ready to go off script and I'm getting ready to now denounce half the stuff I wrote, you know, because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit my life. I can no longer do all of that. I can't, I can't volunteer at the school and in the jail and do the church and do the neighborhood. I can't do it all. And that was a very scary place. And I hid out for a long time and I thought, I don't want to tell anybody that we're resting. But the reality is it's like a lie. Like I, if I'm going to be honest in all the other stuff, I have to be totally brutally honest about all of this and understand that, that God's grace covers all of it. And this was his direct permission, command, however you want to say it of, hello, you have to stop everything. And for those things that you can't stop, I will now begin to move your neighbors out. Can I just say that one of my favorite things about you, that your journey doesn't make sense, that it isn't Ugh. just this straight line to Jesus. That's like, oh yeah, like that one thing builds on top of the other. I actually think that even for me as a as someone watching from a distance, that that is permission for freedom, for freedom yeah. that, hey, I have been building like for the last nine years, it's felt like this building on top of building, like you said, a platform I didn't mm -hmm. realize. And all of a sudden, it just felt like six layers got ripped out from under me. And it doesn't make sense. And so I don't know how to talk about that without it seeming like, okay, well, where did you go wrong? Like, I feel like that's yes. the thing. Like, yes. All right. So what part did you, where's the sin issue or where's the, okay, I lost. And the reality that that's, that is all of our journey with Christ is no, I actually was following Jesus all six, not perfectly. Like yep. I've fallen on my face a thousand times, but for six layers, I've been following Jesus and he still ripped out six of those later layers and was like, okay, we're going to start now we're going to build again, but it actually isn't going to look anything like what you yes. just built. Yes. That is my, f I love that about you. I love that your journey has not made sense yeah. because that resonates to the deepest part of my core right now of yeah. I'm not alone <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like me too. This doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Why have I been doing this for six years? And now I'm like, okay, so none of that applies anymore. Yes. Also all summer long. I, that was my biggest angst. I was like, where the neighbors, the neighbors are gone because when you get evicted, you just move out overnight. Like it's, it's super fast. You know what I mean? Like you don't see it coming. No one says, Hey, we're moving in a month. They yeah. just are gone. So it was a realization of, Oh snap, all the neighbors are gone. And now I'm going to homeschool and now we don't have a church plan. And what are we doing? And it was, it was warring within myself of, did I believe any of that stuff that I said? Did I believe any of that stuff that I wrote? And the realization was absolutely hmm. like, absolutely. It was a necessary learning experience. We learned what it looks like, come alongside the poor. We learned what it looks like to be an intentional neighbor. Um, we learned so much, but hmm. it was for a season and it does not negate anything that God did in that season that can't continue. Does that make sense? Oh, like God yeah. did this thing and that thing is over. And now he's doing a new thing with us and, and we're going to walk this new way. And it doesn't, it doesn't cast shade on what we, what we used to do. And I'm not going to throw that out with the bathwater. You know what I'm saying? But we're in the new, your new season and this is different and it's okay. Like it's okay. Yeah. I yeah. think of my son, my son, Josiah, when he was younger, used to love to do Legos. And my husband was incredible doing Legos with him. And they would build these amazing creations, like, and it would take days sometimes, just days of building. On, at one point, they built this ship that had all sorts of detail. And, and it wasn't like a kit. They were creating this. Oh, wow. But at the end of every creation... I mean, they would enjoy it for a day or two, but then they would just tear it apart. And I remember feeling it's like, why would you like, why would you tear it <laughs> apart? That took so much work. But even at that young age, my son understanding, it's not about what we just created. It's about me and dad doing yes. this together. And if I don't tear this apart, then we're not, then that ends our connection. So yes. no, we need to tear it apart because I want to build something with him right. again. Yeah. And that beauty of us, like 
God tearing down those layers to be like, it's not about the layers. It's about you and me. And that's found in the quiet and in the not doing. And I'm just, as I hear your story and I think about all of us who go, go, go is just the prayer. It sounds crazy, but that God would continue to bring our life to a screeching halt yeah, and remind us that in everything that we do, it's not about what we're doing. It's no, about it's who we're becoming. Yeah. yeah. And who it's about us, us and God, like, and if we need yeah. to go down nine layers to get back to and be reminded, it doesn't mean that those nine layers didn't matter. Yeah. It's a beautiful, I'm going to sit with that imagery all, all day now. I'm all about the image. You like bring pictures. <laughs> Girl, this is why you need to write a book. Well, let me get, I have just a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, the one I would love to hear right now in this season, eight months later, what does it look like for you and Jesus in your, your growing in your relationship with him in a quieter season when, as you yeah. said, life's kind of coming to a screeching halt? I think for me, it is caring for my body. And understanding that Jesus loves all of me, including my body, and that I'm to take care of it. Mm. Um, so I'm spending a lot of time, you know, just focusing on what am I eating. I am trying to exercise more. I'm trying to be intentional about sitting really still and really quiet, learning how to breathe. My heart has been racing for years, and I just never really noticed it until recently because my life got really slow. And I realized, oh, my, my heart races all day, not just at night. <laughs> like, it doesn't stop. Learning how to breathe. And in that process of of that realizing that I'm going to learn how to breathe, not so that I can teach someone else to breathe, but because I need to breathe. And it's the same way about approaching God's word. That's not so that I can teach it for someone to someone else. It's because I need it. So I'm being really selfish about what I'm putting into my soul and into my head because I need it. Not because I think I have to give it away. Amen. I will eventually, but not today. So yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing is I'm going to be really selfish. This is for me, you know, because it has to be, I have nothing to give anyone. You know, I'm an empty like shell of a human being. When we were in college, dad and I, and I would often joke like on his hall of men, he would constantly say like, they're like shells of human beings. Like there's like, they're just shells. There's just like nothing inside. You know, uh, I was like that freshman boy, you know, just not knowing what's going on. But I realized that's what I had become. I had become like this shell of a, of a human doing. I was doing all this stuff, but I was dead on the inside. If Lori today mm -hmm. could sit down for coffee with Lori eight months ago in the first episode we talked and obviously everything had just kind of come down, what would you want to say to her if you were able I would just tell her to release the church, hmm. like let it go. That was at the biggest source of marital strife all summer long. It was the biggest point of conversation. It took up all of my headspace, wondering how we were going to make it work and what could we do. We felt so responsible for ensuring its success. And I would just tell her, just let it go. It's not yours. God invited you into it for a season, but he's building this church and he doesn't need you anymore. It's okay to walk away, but just, it, it's okay. Like you're not a failure. I think I felt like a failure all mm. summer. So I wasn't going to ask this question, but I'm realizing if they didn't hear season one, I'm going to get a, a lot of flack for not asking. Okay. So maybe you have a new, maybe something's changed for you, but is there anything fresh and new that you're like, wow, this is incredibly superficial of me? <laughs> um, yes, probably so. Thad and I have moved a television into our bedroom, which we've never had a TV in our room. And we binge watch a lot of Netflix at night, particularly oh. on all these like snow days. And um, we've never been huge TV watchers, but we freaking love every show on the BBC. Like we've watched. Everything. Really? <laughs> yes. Our, our favorite one that we just finished was Broadchurch. So listeners, if you've not binge watched Broadchurch on Netflix, you're going to need to get on that today. Like, don't stop. Just watch all three seasons. It'll take you probably three days. <laughs> you will be a different person. Different person. It's the best written show of all time. So it's Broad Church? 
Yes. You right. act like you've never heard of it. I it's know. phenomenal. What? Are you, are you living under a rock? <laughs> I, I, I am in a little you bit. Watch it. I only have Hulu. Is it something oh. that I got to get? Uh, see, I'd have to get real TV. Netflix. But you could do Netflix and All you right. could get a free trial for a month. Watch that sucker in three days and be done. Yeah. <laughs> then call it, a, call it a, no, you can't call it a day. At that point, you call it a week. I don't know. <laughs> <That week. laughs> Lori, as usual, this has been such a blessing and an encouragement to me. I'm, I'm really excited to share this story with our listeners. And I'm going to say, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. I think that your the way that you tell your story, your honesty and your vulnerability, that God, even though you may want that pretty bow, I think that God's using it powerfully without the bow to help bring freedom to others. So thank you for that. You're super kind. Thank you for having me. And thank you for helping me verbally process it all. Because normally I kind of keep it to myself. And I I, and I need you to know I I probably won't listen to this episode because I don't ever listen to any podcast that I'm on. Because I'm like, why did I say that? That was like the dumbest thing ever. I will not be offended because I try and tell people (laughs) I have to because we do like edits and things. Yeah. But it is, I, we've been doing this. This is our second season. It is still very hard to listen to my own voice. I have to go into it being like, you are not going to tear yourself apart and you're not going to send a thousand edits about, oh, can you cut out when I said this? Because I would just cut out everything I said. So we're our own worst critics. When I hear myself speak, I'm like, oh, that's why I write. (laughs) Like back it up and delete that. I can make it make better sense. <laughs> That's amazing. Sure. Maybe I should become a writer. This is something to think about. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you. And yeah, I look forward. Who knows? Maybe you'll be our third returning. We'll just let another eight months yes. go. See where you are then. Yes, that'd be awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Lori. <laughs> Okay, ladies, that was my friend, Lori, and I have a, just a ton of notes, but a couple of things I wanted to talk about, and Lori, you can pipe in at any point. I sure will. <laughs> One of the things that really kind of resonated with me is the connection I felt with her and just so many aha moments of being in transition right now. And that is the season I find myself in. And when she was talking about this idea of making smaller circles, of realizing that even as they made the decision to leave their church, they kind of had stepped into the transition that there were still so many voices speaking in that she couldn't hear the Holy Spirit and what he had to say. And real talk, that definitely triggered like waterworks for me, a lot of tears and a lot of thought after because I am in this place of just recently transitioning out of a church. I'm a very, like I am a people person and I love being around people. And I also value like people's advice and wisdom. But this has been this really strange time of my soul almost just longing for smaller circles and longing to hear the Holy Spirit and realizing that in order for me to do that, I've got to quiet things down, which means saying no to people and which means choosing less time, hanging out with friends over coffee and telling them all the things, even when their advice is amazing, which honestly, I love my friends and I love the things they have to say, but giving up those things for more moments of quiet before God and just hearing what he has to say. And so talking to Lori today, God just used her story to not just minister to my heart, but really just to speak what I know God is saying and needed almost that two by four over the head of, you know, that this is what I'm calling you to do. 
It's funny on a podcast to have such great visualizations, but those small circles, and when I think of you, Bethany, in the past, you were in like this crazy network, like I think of the kind of IT, so many different hubs and energies going through, and you see now where you want to be with the circle, but being in the middle of it, moving from one to another, and how Lori mentioned that during transitions is when we doubt ourselves and those anxieties come up. Even personally, I might see a goal that I have in mind and I know that I want to get there, but on the way, that's when I'm like, am I sure that this is what I want to do? Is God leading me this way? And you just have those anxieties and those doubts. And so kind of nice to hear Lori talk about those small circles made that visualization for you of where you wanted to be that you might have not articulated before. Absolutely. No, I love, I love a good word picture because it just stays in my head. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it almost gives me a target to aim for, but I definitely fall prey to that lie that when I'm following God, that it should just feel natural. (laughs) And this has been the opposite kind of transition. It doesn't feel natural. And in every way, like here I am doing a podcast with you. It's going amazing. We have more and more listeners And yet I'm feeling this call to be quieter and spend less time on social media and platforms and places where you push these kinds of things and to really trust God to surrender those things and let him do what he's going to do with all of this, like with Hey Girl and with speaking and to listen to his voice when he said, okay, girl, today your phone goes off and it's just me and you. And it's going to be quiet and it's going to be beautiful, but you have to choose that because I'm just being totally honest. If it's the decision between sitting quietly or going out to coffee with girlfriends, I'm coffee every single time. Lori mentioned the dashboard and knowing what those signals say and... You can ignore it and be like, I want to go out to coffee. I know the dashboard says it's quiet time, but I'm going to go. And you can do that with your car too and say, I'm going to drive it even though the signal keeps popping up and you're just going to head for heartache or a troublesome situation. So I'm not exactly sure. I don't have the answers on how to check your dashboard. One of the things that she shared was was a zinger like for me just this moment of realizing that i've come out of these years of doing full-time youth ministry and being involved at a church and having other things like other relationships like family and things that i've kind of been wondering and almost feeling guilty about why am i so tired right now and i don't mean just tired like oh i want to take a nap tired but like soul emotionally tired goodness yeah like like a different kind of depth of exhaustion and when she said that line that about being in ministry and one of the unique aspects of that is that you are included in everyone's sorrow and tragedy and i i could have just paused there for a really long time i'm getting choked up thinking about it but the realization that these last few years i have loved and I still do. I love full-time ministry, but there has been a lot of sorrow and tragedy and loss and giving myself grace to be tired because that was a unique part of the journey that God brought me on in being in the position that I was in. It wasn't a bystander position. It was a feet in the mud, in the thick of it, hospital rooms, counseling sessions, mediator in the midst of fighting families kind of position. And it was absolutely the race that God called me to. And he absolutely gave me the grace to get through that. But it is okay that I am tired. (laughs) And it is okay that right now, the thing that God's called me to is to step out of the mud, to make my circle smaller and to rest. And I love when she talked about counseling because I'm a huge proponent. I've talked about it on this before. I'm open about the fact that I see a counselor myself, but I've never heard anyone say, and I loved it, that everyone should see a counselor. And the reason being that you need someone in your life that doesn't need you. And you want to talk about something that applies to women, like 
We need someone in our life that doesn't need us, that we can talk to and be open with that isn't taking from us. And that's an okay kind of selfish decision to make. That was straight to the heart. I clearly shed a lot of tears from this interview now that I'm thinking about it. They might not have been happy tears, but they were good tears because we're working through some things. And sometimes it feels like conversations on this podcast can be a counseling session. And sometimes to that point, I'll even think of those closest to me as like, oh, a counselor, let me tell my husband about my troubles today. And if you look at traditional roles of men and females, men want to fix it. And he'll be like, oh, maybe you should do this and talk to that person. And here's kind of a solution. And I'm like, no, I don't want a solution. (laughs) I just wanted to get this off my chest. And I think part of the reason of being so tired after ministry, I haven't served in ministry, but you're trying to carry that load with people. You're trying to share that experience. You're not trying to fix it, but you're trying to walk along with them. So to be able to just take a deep breath and feel tired, that's just where you are today. And it's really courageous of you to share that as well. (laughs) I don't know about courage, but I'll just (laughs) blubber on my... uh... The Hey Girl podcast. (laughs) Anything else from you on Lori's interview? Things that stood out to you or maybe that God just spoke specifically to your heart? I think it was pretty insightful how Lori talked about being selfish with the gospel and Bible. And there's always this negative connotation with selfishness, of course, um, because we all want to be giving and invest in others' lives, but she, her motivation for being in the gospel for so long has been to share it with someone else and to encourage others. And for the first time, she's just taking it for herself. And so if you're out there, maybe it's time for you to be selfish too. And you're, you know, caring for your kids or your parents or others in your community, and you're not slowing down enough to have the gospel just connect with you directly and have that intimate relationship with God. And that's definitely something that I need to work on is being selfish and saying, no, I need to spend more time and grow deeper in my faith Mm. right now. I think that's a good challenge to leave them on listeners who are out there and this is, and I'm not saying this is a hundred percent because again, we're all in a different place, but if you're in that place right now where this was a big episode for you and a moment for you to be like, okay, I actually need to take some time. I need to slow down. I need to shrink down my circles. I need to quiet down the voices, whatever it is. Maybe it's in the area of counseling. Maybe you're like, okay, I've been putting this off for a long time, but I really need to do this. I know that can be super scary. I talk about it openly as though it was never a scary thing for me. It absolutely can be a scary thing. And I know some people are like, I can't afford to see a counselor. Find a pastor, like, or just find a woman that you you admire and you look at her life and you're like, man, I want to be like this person. Like, it's okay to start out to just sit down with someone again that doesn't need you, that you can share with and talk with and pray with. And I promise you, no matter what sacrifice you made to make these things happen, it's going to be worth it. And real talk, I just said that to you, but I was really saying it to myself. (laughs) (laughs) A little bit of both. It was a little bit of both. But girls, no matter where you're at in your race, whether you're up on your feet and you are in the sprint and it is going awesome, or whether you're tired and honestly you've been running for quite a while and it's time to slow down we just want you to know that we are actually praying for you in fact did before we started recording today it's true yes you're on our hearts and we're with you in this journey so if you want to reach out message us Um, you can find us on instagram facebook all of these places we love to hear your stories we also like to write back so if you send us messages maybe you just need a word of encouragement or maybe you have a word of encouragement We appreciate both sides of that. So we love you. We're praying for you. Most of all, we want to encourage you to continue to run your race in your place and keep being awesome for Jesus. Bye, girls. So today we're going to go into the second half of Lori's story. So it's important to know the first half (laughs) of the second before the second. (laughs) It's important. <laughs> so, Laurie, you said it well, and I forgot what you said. <laughs> My mind just went blank. 